here over at Sales Qualia. And uh, today I got thinking about the idea of doing the work versus doing the right work. One of the projects I've been working on starting yesterday, uh, longer than this in my mind, but really getting down to, getting down to the work, uh, is a new book project. And as part of the book project, I've been thinking about sales systems and sales accelerators and what every startup needs in order to grow and scale their company. And as I started thinking more about one of the biggest challenges I think that most startups have is that many times, you know, whether you're a startup founder thinking about sales or more broadly, all of us, we get into a situation where we feel like we're doing the work and that becomes enough for us. What I mean by that is like do like, for example, take exercise and I'll talk more about this in a couple minutes, right? Some of this might feel like, well, I'm doing, you know, 20 minutes a day, three times a week. Like that's what my doctor told me to do. So I'm doing enough. Well, that's not enough because just because you're exercising 20 minutes a day for three days a week doesn't necessarily mean that you're healthy or someone that says, well, I got my 10,000 steps in today. I remember once my talking to my mom a few years ago, I was visiting over Christmas and she started walking this one mile loop around her neighborhood and she was doing it for time. And I said, well, why are you doing that for time? And she said, well, I was go I went into my doctor and I told him I've been doing my 10,000 steps. And she had one of these trackers that was showing her, showing, you know, doing, doing my 10,000 steps every day. And her doctor said, well, that's great, but what are you doing for exercise? And she said, well, I'm, uh, I'm doing 10,000 steps. And the doctor said, well, that's great, but what are you doing for exercise? And so she was mistaking doing 10,000 steps as exercise because that's what she thought was the right thing to do. Turns out what she wasn't doing is getting her heart rate up. And so her doctor said, well, why don't you find this one mile loop and see if you can do that loop in under, I think it was like 20 minutes or something like that. And so that gave her a reason to push a little bit and to raise her heart rate and to actually get, you know, a little bit of sweat and burn going beyond just, you know, 10,000 steps uh, every single day. And so I think what happens for a lot of us is we're either Lulled, in, lulled into a false sense of security, or we just don't know that the work that we're doing isn't the right work. Um, another example of this for me is when uh, about four and a half years ago, I competed in a, a multi-day ultra triathlon. So I do ultra running now, which are 50, 100, 200 mile running races. Uh, back then I was still doing triathlons and I found out about this multi-day ultra triathlon. So basically the ultra piece was that the swim, so for context, let me back up the context, an Ironman, which I've done three Ironmans, an Ironman race is a 2.4 mile swim, then a 112 mile bike, then a 26.2 mile run or marathon. And that's you know a, a pretty high level of fitness and endurance that a lot of people aspire to do. I did three of them and I think they're amazing and it was a, a wonderful opportunity for me to really prove what I could do to myself. Those are races that you have, I think it's 17 hours to complete the course in that day. So you start at usually five or six in the morning, you have till midnight is usually cut off. I've got, I got my time down to, you know, 11 hours and change. So on the, you know, top half of the, the time spectrum, but certainly not among the fastest people. Um, so for context, that's an Ironman, which I know a lot of people have a mental model of. The Uberman race that I did, the swim was 21 miles. So just the swim was a 21-mile swim across the Catalina Channel down off of the coast of Los Angeles. So swimming from Catalina Island back to shore. Then the bike segment was 400 miles from Los Angeles to Death Valley. And then the run course was a 135-mile ultramarathon from Badwater, which is 278 feet below sea level, up to the portal on Mount Whitney, which is about eight, eight or 9,000 feet. So this is a, a multi-day ultra triathlon. It was gonna take me, I estimated five to six days to complete this, <coughs> excuse me. And so I was doing the training that I would normally do for an Ironman. Uh, I was doing swimming, cycling, running, and in a lot of a lot of days doing two workouts a day. I'd do a swim in the morning, a bike in the afternoon. I'd do a bike and then a run. Or I'd do a run in the morning and swim at night. And doing that four or five days a week, I'd have two, two workouts per day for four or five days a week. And then on my low days, I'd only do one workout a day. And so I was in this, in this zone of training where I was just upping my mileage 
because I felt like I got to train to do a 20 mile swim. I got to train to do a 400 mile bike. I got to train to do 135 mile run and do all of those three things in a four or five, six day window, six day window. And the problem that I realized is through some help from a coach, a guy named Brian McKinsey that my wife uh, pointed out to me is that I was, I thought I was training the right way. I thought I was doing the right work. I thought I was preparing myself to do these distances. And she had found out about Brian through CrossFit. And I think she found a book or something from his, from him that she bought. And so I checked him out and I booked a call with him, paid for a, call, a phone session with him. And I was explaining to him this race uh, that I was training for. And after he finished laughing, he said, okay, so like, what, what's the problem here? And I said, well, the problem is I don't know, like I'm already swimming 30,000 yards in a week, like 30,000 yards in a week, like uh, 17, 1,700 yards is a mile, roughly speaking. Right. So you can do the math on that. Like I'm swimming, you know, 10 to 15 miles in a week in a pool doing laps. Right. Then I cycled 150 miles, so three, four days on the bike, anywhere from a long 80-mile ride to a shorter 20-minute ride or 20-mile ride, um, racking up 150 miles in a week, and then also doing some running, so running 40 miles in a week. So it's like a massive amount of miles. And I said, I don't know how, much, how I can possibly get more miles into my training. Like, how am I going to prepare for a 21-mile swim? And he laughed. He said, well, you can't. Like who, who can train for a 21 mile swim? You can't, you can't train for the length of that swim. What you have to do is prepare your body to withstand the damage that you're going to, to, that you're going to sustain when you try to swim 21 miles and then bike 400 miles and then run 135 miles. And so what he had helped me realize is that the type of training I was doing while I thought I was doing the right training was actually totally wrong. The, the training that if I was to continue to pursue that level of distance and mileage, I would not have actually prepared myself and my body to do the race that I was in fact training for. And so I was, I consider myself a pretty, pretty highly educated person when it comes to training. I'd done at the point, that point three Ironmans, I'd done a couple marathons, I'd done uh, some other long distance you know, races. Um, so it wasn't like I was a novice to training. Like I, I knew what I was doing. I knew about nutrition. I knew about, you know, fat, fat adaption and, you know, how to make sure I'm eating right and how to lose weight and do, you know, do all the things I, I thought after I met him, then I realized all the things I thought were right were actually wrong. Why is that important? What does that have to do with sales and startups? What it has to do with sales and startups is that when it comes, when you're looking at like, you look at what you're doing right now with your business. I think a lot of us, you know, a lot of people out there, and I see this myself because I'm a founder of a company and I get the emails and the emails and the messages and the phone calls that other founders get and other company owners get. We think like what's happening is that people think they're doing the right thing. They think, well, I'm doing outbound. Like I have an outbound sequence that is running. I am sending out emails to a list of prospects. So check the box, I'm doing outbound, right? Demo, product demos. Well, people request a demo, I get on Zoom and I show them the product and I show them all the great features about the product. So I must be doing demos the right way or I'm doing, this is how demos are done. Check the box, I'm doing demos. People ask for proposals. So I type pro proposals. I There's even software out there that you can buy to help you draft and send a proposal. So Customer asks for a proposal. I do research on the best way to create a proposal. I put down what I think is the best price and I send it. So I'm doing proposals. Now the fact that those proposals never get replies or those prospects go dark or they come back to us looking for more discounts. Um, I guess like, well, well, I guess that's just the way it is, right? Or if I'm doing outbound and I'm only getting 1% reply rate or 2% reply rate and half the replies are unsubscribed and take me off my list. Well, oh, well, I guess that's just the way outbound works. It's no different than me thinking, well, oh, well, I guess if I want to train for a 21 mile swim, I guess I'll have to just do 30,000 miles a week in the pool. Well, that's not right. Like to do outbound the right way means that you should have double digit engagement rates, not 1%. 1% is the same as what you'd get in direct mail. 
pretty much. Like if you do a direct mail campaign, marketers know this. Do a direct mail campaign, you get half of 1% of a reply rate. One out of every 200 people replies to your direct mailer. That's, that's considered good, right? Most people, when they're doing outbound, are doing much better than that. Maybe one, two, three percent at best. But the perception is, well, I'm doing outbound. I've copied these templates that I've seen other people use. That must be how outbound is done. So I'm going to do that too. And just sort of deal with the consequences. Not really questioning, well, just because I'm doing the work doesn't mean I'm doing the right work. And I, I, I'm, I'm using this concept, I'm sharing this concept with you because in this time of year, you have an opportunity. You have an opportunity any time of the year, but especially right now, this time of the year, if you ever wanted to make a change and really wanted to analyze what you're doing and really ask yourself, like, am I really doing the right work? Because the downstream effects of doing the wrong work are pretty detrimental. In fact, they get to the point of overwhelming or even crippling. Like, let's use this outbound sequence, this outbound cadence as an example. Right? So if you're sitting there, you're running a company, you're running a startup, and let's say you, you, you tell your investors, you tell your team, look, over the next, you know, by December of this year, we want to get to $3 million in revenue. And our average contract value is $100,000. And so you do the math on that, and you figure out like how many new customers you need to grow from 1 million to 3 million, so it's a net increase of $2 million per year. Your average contract value is 100K, so you're like, hey, we got to add 20 net new customers at 100k each and you're like okay that's the, that's like the bottom of the funnel assuming we get the acb for each of those deals we get those 20 so what does that come to it's a roughly two new customers per month and then you start working up from there and you're like okay well based on the conversion rates we've got in the pipeline if our or if our current pipeline rate conversion rate is 12 percent then you scratch your head and, or 10 percent you know even if it's 20 percent you say to yourself, well, if it's 20% and I got to get I got to get 20 new customers this year, that means I have to have 100 qualified deals in the pipeline. I got to I got to create, I got to build my pipeline. People talk about I got a nice big healthy pipeline. And then you say to yourself, well, how do I create 100 new opportunities this year to get to the 20 that are going to convert at 100 ACV? You say, well, geez, like, how are we generating leads right now? Well, we can't really do conferences and booths because those are out, you know, as of last year. Probably not coming back this year with any meaningful, in any meaningful way. Um, you know, we might be doing some inbound that's working and the inbound leads we get are pretty good, but we don't get a lot of inbound leads. Like maybe we get, you know, 10 inbound leads a month and those convert at a certain rate, maybe a little better than than most because they're inbound. So now you're, you're sitting there going, well, let's say, let's say you get, you know, 10 leads a month. Um, and you got to, you know, you got to qualify them and of those 10 leads, only two or three of them actually turned into qualified. So that means you got to do three or four months worth of inbound to get one or two deals. And now you're still stuck with 18 deals you got to manufacture, right? So you start to see the numbers pile up and then you go further up in the funnel. Now you started with how many paying customers you needed and what revenue you went up and said, well, this is our current conversion rate. So based on the ACV and, and based on the number of deals, this is how many deals we have to create in the pipeline at 20% conversion rate. And then you go a step further up and you go, well, geez, if we're if outbound is the way we're going to go, um, or we need to accelerate our outbound, if our conversion rate is only 2%, that means for every 100 people that we're emailing, 2% engage, maybe like half of one, like out of every 10 engagements, you land up with one opportunity you're like, wow, like how many thousands of people do we have to get on our list? How many thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of emails do we have to send to create those engagements, to get those initial meetings, to get those meetings at some conversion rate into the pipeline, which are going to convert downstream at 20%. All of a sudden you realize like, God, like these numbers are insane. There's no way for me to, to get there in any meaningful way. And oh, by the way, it's already January. So I'm down to under 12 months to hit that $3 million target or the $2 million net new. And so if you're in that kind of situation, you got to really ask yourself, like you got to have that meta level analysis or that, that emotional professional maturity to look at what you're doing going like, okay, we're doing the work. We're doing outbound, we're doing inbound, we got pipeline, we're doing demos. We got some of those deals that are converting at whatever ACV. But is it really the right, are we really doing the right work? 
Because if you take those numbers and let's just say magically you raise the bar you get from a million to three by exploding the amount of outbound you do, exploding the number of emails you send, exploding the number of contacts in your database that you're batching and blasting to. What happens at the end of 2021? And you raise that next round of capital and you look at the investors and you give them the next year or two pro forma and you say, look, we're gonna go from three to 10 million in revenue in the next you know, two years. So by the end of 2023, you're gonna be tracking at a $10 million ARR. And you take those same numbers that I just explained to go from one to three, and you gotta do this, you gotta multiply that out from three to 10, you gotta three X what I just explained. That should make your head explode if you're using these kinds of numbers and conversion rates. And I'm sharing this with you because I think it's so critical. I don't, I, I just don't see enough people really questioning. I wasn't doing it myself when I was, when I was training, right? It was only through a fortunate uh, recommendation from my wife who has done CrossFit and goes to CrossFit classes and she's a PhD in economics and she's a natural researcher. She had found out about this guy and said, you should check him out. And I checked him out and I started reading some of the, the training methodologies and realized like I'm doing this the wrong way. So fortunately I had this, in a lot of ways, this angel came down manna from heaven, this knowledge from my wife, say, you should check this guy out. And at least I had the internal compass to say, I should at least take a look at it as opposed to saying like, what, what would my wife know about training for an Ironman? She's never done an Ironman. I've done three of them. So at least I was open-minded enough to accept this new perspective and investigate it, which I did. And fortunately it worked out. So I ended up competing in the race. I did the swim. I did the 21 mile swim. It turned out to be 24 miles because of currents and wind. Um, I wasn't able to finish the whole bike, wasn't able to finish the whole run. I got pretty far in the race. And since then, you know, that was really just a starting point for me in this whole new direction in how I train and how I prepare. So even if that race wasn't the success I wanted it to be, it was the building block. It was a stepping stone for me. It was the transition away from the old way to the new way, from doing the work to doing the right work. And now because of that experience, it's become a natural part of my training regimen to go back and question and look and look for, read articles, read about nutrition, read about fat burning, read about ketones, read about um, the right way to, to stretch and mobility and flexibility and all of those things. I'm constantly questioning because of that experience. And because of that, it's what's allowed me to continue to push farther and further when it comes to the, the ultra running that I'm doing now. So my advice to you is like, look, if you're if you're sitting there and you're wondering if you're already frustrated with the year and saying like, oh man, like, am I really, is this really the way it's going to work this year? Is this really the numbers? Is this really the process that we're going to follow? I think you really got to take a moment and ask yourself if it, if it seems like it's wrong, if it's intuitively not jiving with what you think it should be, if it doesn't feel aligned to the way you want to sell. Like who wants to batch and blast 10,000 people every month and send out hundreds of thousands of emails just to get 1% of them to reply? Because it's not even about the 1% that reply. What about the other 99% that are pissed off or ignoring you because your messaging sucks <laughs> or you're targeting the wrong person or they're just annoyed that you put them on a, a, an email campaign they didn't ask to be on, right? There's got to be another way, right? And that's why we teach the sales accelerators, that's the nine sales accelerators. That's why I'm writing the book that I'm writing now because we've been teaching, I've been teaching these nine sales accelerators now for a couple of years in workshops and webinars, using them with our clients, doing assessments, helping people get really clear about like what are the systems you don't even know you need to build? What are the unknown unknowns? So number one, like what, what, which of these nine sales accelerators did you not even know about? So that's step one. Step two is, which of those nine accelerators are you doing right now suboptimally that either you know are doing suboptimally and you don't know how to do it better or you think worse that you're doing it the right way. Turns out you're doing it the wrong way and it's costing you in all kinds of ways down the road and immediately. So, um, so my advice to you is, you know, take a hard look at what you're doing, whether it's on sales or fitness or, or training. Um, and just if, if it doesn't seem right, if the numbers don't add up, take a minute and really ask yourself, why is that? Why does it not seem right? Because chances are 
maybe it's not, maybe it's just that, maybe it's that you're just not doing the right work. I mean, I applaud you for doing the work. It's important for doing work. The hustle and the hard work is important, but the hustle and hard work is not going to get you to where you want to go over the long run. Hustle and hard work gets you out of the garage, you know, get you onto the race course, you know, get your startup off the ground, but the hustle and hard work are not going to be what gives you that more predictable, repeatable, scalable sales process that you're looking for. All right, that's it. That's my message for today. Doing the work isn't enough. It's about doing the right work. This is Scott Sambucci signing off.